the scriptures teach in Acts second chapter. But the series of lessons for you to examine yourself and see if your daily behavior, your speech, the way you walk, your lifestyle, does it measure up to the claim that you are the church that Christ built? So in other words, in accordance with the original blueprint of what Jesus set aside, him being a carpenter, he made it clear what he wants in his church. Do you have these foundation, foundational principles, these characteristics that can be found in Acts? There's more to it, but understand the first church had some foundational principles that allowed them to be the church that Christ built. Acts 2nd chapter, verses 41 through 42 is where we will get our text from, or our series from, sermon from. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. So who were these people? To make sure, you need to first of all, gladly receive the word. That means you have to want the word and say, okay, I believe the word. Amen. And if you believe the word, then you want to repent and be baptized because you believe the word. Once you get the word, you believe the word, you're baptized because of the word, that doesn't mean you stop right there. Now, because our end, I mean, there's some things you still have to do. What is it? We see that they continued in the, the disciples to, to become disciples. They continued in devoting themselves to the apostles' doctrine, or as American teaching, we would say teaching, Fellowship, breaking of the bread, and in prayers. The last few sermons or the last four we explored what the gospel is. Because again, it's important for us to know what the gospel is. So if someone's preaching or teaching a lesson, you'll know the difference between a lesson that we need to hear and what a gospel lesson is or gospel preaching is. How to obey the gospel. What it is to obey the gospel. What it means you need to do in order to become a child of God. We talked about the Apostles' Doctrine, what the teaching was, what would be the basis of what they were teaching in uh, at these first Christians. Secondly, then we would have had fellowship. What does fellowship mean? And again, the word fellowship is participating in a relationship. That's the basis of this word. A foundation, a husband and wife that's not truly in a relationship are not fellowship with one with another. No husband, no wife is going to let you be gone all week long and just show up on one day talking about I love you and now you want to shower with gift. That ain't a relationship. I don't know what you call it, but hey, but that's how we treat God. And we say we're in fellowship. So if you're not going to accept it, just know God ain't going to accept it either. And then we talked about breaking the bread last week. Breaking the bread is a meal and the Lord's Supper. They did it as one thing. Agape meal, love feast. Those were the things where they got together. Every time they got together to worship the Lord, they had a meal. Also, I want to remind you that the church back then was in the afternoon service. There was no morning service. We brought that in. But the point of this I'm saying is, after they worked all day long, they got together on a Sunday evening, and they brought food because they know folks will be home. Oh, you remember in Acts, oh, Acts 1 Corinthians 11, where he says, now you're seeing the abuse of what was going on. That's what Paul was addressing. So again, if we want to do that, if we want to see, we want to go back to the way it used to be, back in the old days, we need to be bringing a meal every Saturday. There's some things that we say we want to do, but we won't do, but you don't have to. But I just want to make sure I threw that out there. And last but not least, on today's lesson, we're going to deal with the prayers that these people continue in. So if we understand it, we look back at Luke. Luke answers his own question for us to understand in Acts. Remember, Luke is the one that wrote Luke. Luke is the one that wrote Acts. Luke wrote Luke and he sent it to uh, most somebody. Uh, what do you call it? Most somebody the office. I gotta say it now. It is so uh, first Luke chapter one, insomuch as many have taken a hand to set it on the narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us. Yeah, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. This is Luke chapter 1. 
and it seemed good to me also having perfect understanding of all things that from the very first to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. So we go to Acts 1, verse 1, the former account I made. What I wrote last time, old Theophilus, all of that Jesus had beget, began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after throughout through the Holy Spirit and given commandments to the apostles to whom he had chosen. We can't read it. So the point of this was to let you know everything that we want to know about what's going on in Acts 2nd chapter as far as definition, Luke already told him. So therefore, we're going to deal with prayers according to what Luke has to say about it. So what's usually overlooked when I see that people do this text and when they want to do prayers is they forget the historical background. For those that have missed, I'm going to make it short, but we've discussed the historical background of what was going on or the current event that was occurring for the first Christians when they were added to the Church of Christ. Simply, it was a Passover and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. We remember that, right? We agree with that because it's important to understand what was going on that lets you know why there were things that were going on that the church was doing when they first got added that you wonder why they were doing it. The Feast of the Unleavened Bread, Exodus 12, 6 through 20, Leviticus 23, 5 through 8, Numbers 9, start 1, reading the verse 5. We've said that on several occasions, but to say is God gave the stipulations, we will say the commandments on what they're supposed to do <coughs> during the Passover and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And it was the custom, or we'll say the tradition, for each person, for every Jew, to pray three times a year. Coming to the day of sacrifices, three times a year, that was they had to be there. Now, when they came to the Passover, there was a daily thing of sacrifices that was going on, um, which was in the morning, the evening, and at night. And at Shabbat, every Sabbath day, they did sacrifices every morning, at noon, or every night, or was it every evening? So we now have instances where. They were doing what they do every Sabbath. They were also doing at the love feast, at the feast of unleavened bread. So the tradition that people were to pray three times a day came from Abraham. They did Genesis 19. They say Genesis 19. Abraham prayed in the morning. Well, he was a morning person, so we know they contributed him every time he gets up early in the morning. He prayed. Isaac was considered an afternoon person. You see instances in Genesis 24, starting at verse 60 through 65, I think, where it talks about um, Isaac praying in the afternoon. Then you had Jacob, who wrestled all night long, and they want to make sure that you understand that there was the mindset of Jacob was a person that liked to pray before he went to sleep. So they took these three patriarchs and said, we're going to pray in the morning, in the evening, and at noon. Plus, God already told them that you're going to do the sacrifices, which they did in the morning, evening, and noon. Evening and noon. Evening and night. So they just incorporated that. So every Sabbath, they had morning sacrifice, afternoon sacrifice, and evening sacrifice. So they just added prayers with this. Now, also at the same time, when they went to the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, guess what they did every day? Sacrifice in the morning, sacrifice in the afternoon, sacrifice in the evening or night. We'll call it night because to us it's night. But just understand that that's what they were doing. So since they were doing prayers at each and every time, so when we read in Acts, second chapter, where they continued in prayers, guess what they were doing? What they were always doing. There was no change except, I'm getting a little ahead of, uh, was here, ahead of myself because I don't want to, to mess that up. We might as well go there. There was a change. They changed the focus of why they were praying all three times a day. Just in case somebody forgot. Remember Daniel prayed three times a day, got in trouble. Uh, the psalmist in Psalms 5, David prayed three times a day. So the disciples of Christ were doing what they were supposed to do, which was the feast of the hundred and prayed supposed to be praying three times a day, supposed to be breaking bread the way they were breaking. 
they were supposed to be, and when it says continued in the apostles' doctrine, they were also at that time supposed to be studying and reading and sharing God's word every day. So continue to stay fast in the apostles' doctrine. Luke lets you know that we're supposed to continue studying God's word. Continue yeah. in the apostles' doctrine. Yeah. So that's what they were doing. Then there were 42, go back over there, in fellowship. They believed that going and eating a meal in Jerusalem and getting together, they were fellowshipping anyway because they were sharing a meal one with another. They were sharing in uh, the breaking of the bread and the wine, which represented their uh, escape and redemption from Egypt and the uh, bondage of slavery. So they were already doing But now Luke says, now there's a new change. So all we're doing is changing their focus. Now, instead of focusing back on when they got through Egypt, got slavery, bondage of slavery, now the redemption is through Jesus and redeemed from the bondage of sin through Jesus. So the breaking of the bread went from the Passover, but Jesus is now the Passover who fulfilled the Passover. So now our focus in breaking the bread is toward Jesus. Then we get to the prayers. Their prayers were for deliverance and all the other things that you're supposed to ask for. We did Psalms, was it 101, 102, 103, where they prayed for deliverance and they prayed for forgiveness and they prayed for a lot of things. Now the focus was no longer on those things, but now it was on the prayers for the kingdom. Bless her heart. That's all like Western. Uh, hey Amen. If you see if you know, make sure my mind's off too. Because I somebody say, uh, you don't know, tell them what mine is like. But <laughs> what I want to make sure to understand is when we say that of devoted, I didn't say this earlier in the first sermon, but the word devoted or continuous steadfast in the Greek, it simply means to occupy oneself persistently or give constant attention to. So they were giving constant attention to all those things that we read in Acts chapter 2, verse number 42. So Luke was making a point to say, even though they were continuing in their normal celebratory customs of that time, they were no longer doing what they were doing for the old purpose of the celebration. The old purpose of the celebration was again redemption from Egypt, bondage of slavery by Moses through God. But now they had a new focus. They were devoted to the new purpose, which was redemption from death, freedom from the bondage of sin by Christ through God. It was still God, but the focus is now changed from the old to the new. So in other words, they were no longer celebrating the shadow of the things to come. They were now celebrating the real thing. This morning, somebody got me missing Sunday school. It, it wasn't, they weren't, they would get the name brand. They were celebrating the generic. I got that from this morning. But, matter of fact, it's Colossians 2nd chapter, verse 17. This will help you make you understand exactly what I mean by they were no longer celebrating the shadow of the things to come. Colossians 2nd chapter, verse 17 says, Therefore, let no one judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to festivals. Unleavened bread. God to a new moon, some tradition they were doing, and the Sabbath, which was we know every Saturday. These are a shadow of the things to come. But the body that casts it belongs to Christ. Y'all see that? He's saying that the new moon, the festivals, and uh, the Sabbath were all shadows of something to come. Now Jesus is here. So instead of celebrating that old time religion, now Jesus is giving you a new covenant. So you don't have to fool. Well, is it live or is it memorized? Somebody, you old enough to remember that one. You don't have to fool with the shadow of stuff when you have the real thing. You don't have to take generic. I love that part because you, you may help me see this. Is that your insurance covers name brand. There ain't no copay when God got it. The real thing. Yeah, it's cheaper. You might even get it free if you take generic. Who that preach all by itself? Yeah. But when God got you, assurance covers, he covers everything. So understand that we don't have to, there are folk out there still worshiping the shadow of the things to come. Yes. Instead of worshiping the body that casts the shadow which belongs to Christ. 
But I have to explain this text because we, I use this text to prove a point. Because I always say, well, by this text, you can't tell somebody that they can't uh, um, have Merry Christmas. What's that thing called? Christmas. You can't tell somebody not to celebrate, uh, have candy out there for Halloween. I don't do it because I want to buy knocking on my door. If, they, if, they, if I felt like somebody knocking on my door, then my son would take it. I could buy candy and take it to the kid. Here, pass that out. I don't, don't come knocking on my door because I, I don't want you knocking on my door. That's why the doorbell don't work. They done broke it from the Halloween, but now anyway. The point is to say, you can't tell people because the people that are religious that tell you you're not supposed to separate your birthday. I understand where they got it from. But Paul said, let no one judge you what you eat or drink or regard to a festival, new moon, or Sabbath. The principle is, don't, tell, let, don't judge somebody about some things that don't have no, nothing to do with salvation. I explained to you. Many Jewish Christians, Acts 15, starting verse 1, felt that the Gentiles, or the Gentile Christians, had to be circumcised. Y'all remember that? Well, if you don't, remember, read off on it. But he said, in order for you to be a Christian, you have to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses as well. Acts, verse, Acts 15, starting verse 1 through 5. But then the apostles and the elders got together, had a meeting, and they dealt with it, Acts chapter 15, verses 6 through 27. Now, what happens now is, when we get to the text where I'm at, Paul has to address the same issue, but what he does is he addresses it in a different angle because he knew his audience. There's some things you can say to somebody straight ass, like the apostles and the elders had to deal with it in Acts 15. Paul, knowing his folk, said, I'm going to say it in an angle that's going to help you understand it. So when we get to Acts, Acts, Colossians second chapter, chapter second chapter starting verse number eleven, Paul points out that through baptism in Christ we experience true circumcision, which is the cutting away of the sins of the flesh. He was saying you don't have to be physically cut. That was under an old law, under somebody else's an old covenant. You're under a new covenant. Therefore. What you need to be concerned about cutting away is the true circumcision, which is through Christ, that cuts away the sins of the flesh. Therefore, by God, by Jesus' death, verse 14, 15, by Jesus' death on the cross, Jesus has taken the old law out of the way. That's what he's saying. Which means it doesn't matter about somebody celebrating Christmas or celebrating the birthday. That's got to be some old stuff we celebrate. Anniversaries. There's a whole bunch of stuff folks say you can't celebrate. But Paul wants you to know we're now, we're now celebrating the real thing. What you talk about don't matter. It has nothing to do with salvation. That's the thing we want to make sure we understand. So if I have lights on my tree, lights on my window, lights on my house, it ain't my house because I ain't putting all this stuff up. So that's for all. <laughs> but what I'm saying is I have a right to do that because that has nothing to do with salvation. Now, if you don't like doing it, you don't want to pass out candy, you don't want to get a free bunny the day after to get their big old basket, all that free stuff half right, that's on you. But don't judge someone else for what they do. When he says eat and drink, I have to throw this out there. If somebody wants to eat pork, but you say you shouldn't eat it, you don't want to have blood pressure. They don't. So don't you eat it. Look at all that bacon you got on your plate. You just wish you had some. Okay, so the point is, be mindful and stop judging folk for stuff that has nothing to do with salvation. So we get to verse number 16 and 17 of the Colossians, second chapter. Don't let anyone judge or condemn, condemn you for keeping with some old traditions. Because those very, those traditions that they were saying you shouldn't keep new moon, you shouldn't keep the Sabbath, you shouldn't keep the um, the festivals. What Paul wanted them to say is, don't condemn them for it, but understand those very traditions pointed to and continue to point toward Jesus. That's all. So we're not under that obligation, but those guys, you remember, they were fresh Christians. They still had some baggage. Matter of fact, let's throw this out there. When you became a Christian, 
you still had some old time baggage that you had to slowly but surely get rid of. Some of us were some of the biggest poor mothers that you had to let go of. Some of us were some of the biggest drinkers, the most tore up from the floor, drunk person they ever was. There were some things you didn't let go of. Some of you used to smoke a little bit of this, left hand cigarette, right hand cigarette, double hand cigarette, Amen. whatever you smoke. Amen. But you, when you had a child, you just didn't stop it overnight. Amen. There's some things in our lives from before, but we all got a win. We used to do this and a win. We used to do that. So Paul was saying, don't beat them up. Matter of fact, as Romans, he told him, be careful when you judge folk because you do the same thing. Romans 2, chapter verses 1 and 2. So every time you judge somebody, he says, don't forget, how are you going to judge them when you were doing the same thing? That's why I'm judging about like, drinking, smoking, doing everything else because I don't think it's too much. I didn't kill nobody. That's why I don't think I did, but I did kill people with my mouth. So I'd be mindful. That's why I, don't, I deal with people with gossip. The point is, Paul saying, don't let anybody judge you over traditions and foolishness, but understand, these people still have to grow. So that means when you see someone coming in tripping over some stuff, they have to grow. So be careful when you call yourself judging folk. Now, they've been in the church 25, 30 years, and they're still doing the same thing. I don't know what to tell you. Just make sure that you just continue that you don't do what they do. But I want to make sure everybody follow what I'm saying, but what, what Paul meant by why he said what he said. Good. So as theologists, the, thank you. I don't know how my lip turned out for the people that you in the ass. As he read Acts second chapter, knowing the tradition of the Passover and the Jewish feast, he would understand what was going on. But also because of Luke's previous letter, he would already know what Luke meant when he said, and they continue steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. That means they were studying a lot. They were studying God's word. But now they were studying the apostles' doctrine and not just what was being said. Fellowship, breaking the bread and prayers. That makes sense, everybody? Good. So now, Luke's account of Jesus' prayer life in Luke defined what he meant by prayer in Acts 42. We don't have to go and do some theological thing, do it, rah, rah, rah. Like we did uh, Friday and next Friday, or Friday or Friday after next. They don't tell us why Craig. And the significance of why Craig ain't got no job. And while all this is happening because Craig ain't got no job, they don't tell us anything in, this, in the sequel. Why? Because if you've seen the first movie, you already know. If he had a job, he wouldn't have looked all the day. So we understand, no job on a Friday. You ain't got no job, you ain't got nothing else to do. This is what's going to happen. So he doesn't mention it in the second sequel. So Luke doesn't address what prayers is because he's already addressed it in the first the first book. Luke notes in Luke second chapter, verses forty through forty two, that Jesus, as a child, observed the customs and traditions going to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover and the feast of the unleavened bread. So now we got why would Jesus be there at the feast of the uh, unleavened bread and the Passover? Jesus did this before. So in Luke. From a child, Luke second chapter, we see it was a custom for Jesus to go. So now we know Jesus went every feast and Passover, Jesus did. So when Jesus does it there, in the, um, they see that those guys are coming. Wait. What they're doing. Sorry, I was trying to get my Bible going. I'm sorry. Well, I don't know what kind of Bible you guys are, but amen. <laughs> Talking Bible, but I guess I'm saying to you. Keep keeping you loving. All right. Um, <laughs> Luke 22, verses 1 through 20, we see Jesus now grown at the Last Supper with Jesus having the Passover. But what did Jesus do that we say every Sunday when he did the Passover? He prayed. He prayed for the bread. And he prayed for the, the contents of the cup. Jesus didn't pray for the cup. Let me just do it out there. He didn't pray for the cup. We don't drink the cup. We drink for the contents of the cup. It's that wine. Man. So there's nothing wrong with people saying, but sometimes people say they made an argument over the, uh, the, the cup. It ain't the cup. It's the contents of the cup. Man. That means something. So Jesus also prayed at the feast. So Theopolis, knowing that this would happen, he now has an idea of what, what is he saying about prayer. So we get into loose prayer. We find out that Jesus was a praying Jesus. 
Jesus was a Messiah that constantly prayed all the time. Let me get it, let me explain first. Prayer. My simple definition, but I'm getting all theological because to me it's a waste of time. It's basically an avenue that we approach God or we can access God to talk to Him directly. That's as clear and as simple as it can be. You have access to God. And you can now talk to them. It used to be you had to go to the priest, and the priest did this for you, and that. Now we have direct access to God. When we have direct access to God in your prayer, talking to God, you can request what you want from God. You can ask something from God. You can ask God to forgive you. You can praise God in your prayer. You can give thanks to God in your prayer. But most of all, when you're talking to God, it's seeking communion, communion with God. I want an audience with you, God, so I can talk to you. Everybody should have that friend where if you had a bad day, you should be able to go talk to him. Now, here's the good friend. You know you got a good friend. When you talk to your good friend, they just let you say everything you need to say. They don't interrupt. They let you say every single thing. Have you ever noticed that when you're talking to God, God don't interrupt you? He just lets you say what you got to say. Which means sometimes the best response is no response. It's to allow you to get it off your chest. So God allows you to say what you need to say. So you can get it off your chest. So you just won't come in with God. Say, Lord, thank you. So Luke shows Jesus being constant in prayer to God, meaning Jesus being the Son of God. Even though he is, knows he's the Messiah, Jesus knew while he was on this earth, in his earthly state or condition, he still needed God. And he was dependent upon God and wanted to communicate with God at every opportunity. When Jesus was making decisions, before he picked up disciples, he prayed. And I was just, I, I wondered why would Jesus pray before he picked those disciples? Honestly, I thought it, was like it, made, it made common sense because Jesus knew that he was going to have to pick, and I'm going to use the puns, where the rascal that was going to betray him. But Jesus knew that Joker was going to betray him, but still, when Judas came, Jesus still said, what can I do for you, friend? He gave him one more opportunity to still change his mind, because unless Judas kissed the man, they didn't know what Jesus looked like. Judas could walk right past Jesus, and they wouldn't have did anything. But whomever you kiss is who we believe we wouldn't want to know who Jesus is. So Jesus had to pray. Jesus also had Peter. He knew that Peter was going to be something else. The boy that Peter, everybody got some Peter in their life. You just said, Lord, have mercy. That person just, I got to pray for you. That, you're going to have some of those people. So Luke records Jesus' prayer life. And we're going to be finished with this. It, it won't take long. I'm going to give you a bunch of scriptures. I'm going to still print it up for Tuesday night, but I'm going to go where we stay in Luke. Luke records the prayers of Jesus, which are only mentioned by Luke that you won't find in any other of the other Gospels. Not that Luke was any better than anybody, but Luke records prayers that are not in anyone else's Gospels. Luke, third chapter, verse number 21. Luke, third chapter, verse number 21. Only Luke records that after Jesus' baptism, the heavens opened, Jesus prayed. You won't find that, Matthew, Mark, and John. Only Luke records that. Luke 9, Luke 9, 18, Luke 9, 18. Jesus, only Luke records, records that Jesus was praying along in Caesarea Philippi. And the question was said, who do people say that I am? Jesus was praying alone, but you don't see that in the other, but he asked the, the disciple, he asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? You won't find it in someone else. And I'm doing it because I want you to go look just to make sure. If you got a reference Bible, you'll see that ain't there. Luke 9, 28 and 29. Luke records Jesus took Peter, James, and John upon the top of the mount to pray when he was transfigured. See if you can find that in the others. Jude, Jesus, Jude, Jesus was praying on the mountain. 
See if you can find. So again, he says some stuff that other folk they talk around it, but only Luke is specific. Uh, Luke 11, 1. This is something that it seems that the disciples said only in Luke's account, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. You get the Lord's example of the Lord's prayer in all of them, well, Matthew, Mark, but you won't see the word that Lord, teach us to pray in Luke 11, except in Luke. Luke 22. Now, I'm, I'm explaining to you what y'all know. Y'all already know why I'm sticking to Luke. Because we need to explain why the opposite would understand what prayer is. Luke 22, starting at verse number 31. Luke prayed for Peter that his faith fail him not. Luke, Luke shows that Jesus prayed for Peter that his faith don't fail him. Luke is on one adventure set. Now, here's the beauty of Jesus. Let me say this is good, right? Luke 3, 21, Jesus was praying at the Jordan River. Luke 9, 18, we find Jesus is praying by himself. Luke 9, 28 and 29, Luke is with Luke. Jesus is praying on a mountain. Luke 11, Jesus was praying in a certain place is where it says. Luke 22, 31 through 32, Jesus is praying for someone else. I'm, I'm showing you a pattern. These are the things that's prayer that we should be doing. Luke 23, verse 34, only Luke tells us that Jesus prayed for his crucifiers. While Jesus was on the cross, only Luke tells us, praying for his enemies. Jesus said earlier, pray for your enemies, pray for those who despitefully use you. Jesus is going to tell them to do something Guess what? He did exactly what he told them to do. This is why Jesus is who he is. Jesus never asked somebody to do something that he wasn't willing to know already had done himself. So on the cross, these jokers are doing what they're doing. Jesus prayed for his crucifixion. You have to ask yourself, how many of us can pray for somebody who's cussing us out like a dog? Right there in front of us. You talk about little yeah, okay. You know we talk about saying get behind me. Okay. Luke is also unique in his gospel when it comes to prayer because he's the only one who records the prayer parables. There are no prayer parables in the other gospels. Luke 11, after the Lord's prayer in Luke 11, 1 through 5, 1 through 4, verses 5 through 8, Jesus gives a prayer parable. 5 through 8. But only, Jesus, only Luke records the prayer at midnight for the persistent friend. Luke 18, verses 1 through 14, two more parables talking about prayer. The begging judge, the widow begging the judge, and then the Pharisee and the tax collector. Remember, he said two came up to pray, and only one stood back behind with his <coughs> Pray. So these parables only can be found in Luke. So again, the office has gotten back to his head. So Luke only records Jesus, only one who records Jesus when he goes to the garden in Gethsemane. And telling his disciples, pray that you may not enter into temptation. He tells everybody else, watch and pray. But Luke gets specific in Luke 22 and 40 and says to his disciples, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Jesus knew what they were going to do later. So other instances of Jesus' prayer life are recorded on the other gospels. I gotta put it out there because we've gotten to the point of saying that Luke ain't the only one to record it things about Jesus' prayer, but you can find it in both scriptures, both gospels. Luke 5, 16, it said Jesus withdrew himself into the wilderness. So that means Jesus was constantly praying, but Jesus didn't have a set place, nor did he have a set time to pray. Jesus prayed when he needed to. Luke 6, 12, he went out to the mountain and prayed and continued all night long in prayer. So you got Jesus praying at night, some of this when you see we got an early in the morning prayer. Uh, Luke 10, 21 and 22, you'll see the reference to Matthew and Mark where G uh, Luke says that Jesus prayed thanking his father. So that's some thanksgiving that should be in prayer. Uh, what's the other one? Luke 22, 41 through 44. Jesus had a place that he always prayed at. Everyone should have this one place that you like to pray. Whatever the weirdest I am, I like sitting on the edge of my bed. That's my prayer place. 
Ain't used to me getting down on one knee because I'm going to be praying to the Lord, help me get up. Ain't used to be doing that. But nothing like sitting on the edge of your bed with your head down before I go to bed and when I get up in the morning. Because I can realize, okay, I'm up. I did not lay my head down for the last time. And when I get ready to go to bed, plus I'll be tired anyway. I just have to sit there and say, okay, Lord, please don't let me ache in the morning. I, I know I am, but I can at least ask. Please let this motion work the whole eight hours. But it's not that I got to do it. But everyone should have their favorite places they want to pray. Luke 23, verse 46. Luke 23, verse 46. Jesus prayed his second prayer on the cross, which was the last words that he said, and he yielded up the spirit to God. You'll see that in all the other accounts. So the point is, Jesus was a praying Messiah. But Luke wants to show him the Messiah that it's a praying Messiah. And he impresses on the Theopolis the importance of prayer by demonstrating the attitude of Jesus and the frequency in which he prayed. So he's now given an account. Let me tell you who Jesus is. You already here, but I want you to see the attitude in why Jesus prayed. And notice, Jesus prayed all the time. And he prayed about a whole bunch of stuff. So when we read Acts, the second chapter, there's no need for Luke to explain what he meant by prayer because it should be already understood by looking at just the book of Luke. That makes sense. That's all I want to make sure you understand. It's not that the other counts don't mean anything, but if he wrote one, he's trying to explain in the other. So folk, they can get theological and explain all these prayers and all these other scriptures, but there's no need to. Let's just stick to that. So because of Jesus' prayer life and the fact that he gave his disciples a pattern on how to pray in Luke 11, 1 through 4, and taught them to pray, but he taught them to pray in boldness and persistence. That's what the, um, the parables come from. Boldness. In Luke 11, 5 through 8, and persistence, no, persistence in 11, 5 through 8, and boldness in Luke 18, 1 through 8. So Jesus said, I want you to be persistent when you pray, but I want you to stand up and be know that God's going to hear you. So by teaching that, that would have been taught to apostles, and now the apostles are teaching this to the disciples, which they are now continuing to stand for to end the apostles' teaching. So y'all see how Jesus is in teach them to observe the things which I've taught you. Matthew 20, verse 19 and 20. So that would mean on the first day the first Christians continue steadfast in what they were taught about Jesus' prayer life and what he said in his prayer. So the Holy Spirit told them exactly what he said. So since Peter was an apostle, he was the first to preach the message. We know that Peter understood what prayer was because he heard his father Jesus said, I pray for you that your faith don't fail you. But he also wants to, uh, Peter wants to understand how important prayer is for the disciple, how important prayer is for the assembly, and how important prayer is for the church of Christ. Because in 1 Peter 3 12, 1 Peter 3 12, Peter says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the faith of the Lord is against them. He wants you to know that your prayers will be hindered if you're in sin. Your prayers are going to be hindered if you're continuing in sin, doing sin. Your prayers will be hindered. So Peter makes a point to tell his audience that God will hear your prayers if you're faithful to him. But because the thing is, if you're faithful to him, then what you're not going to do is you're not going to ask God to give you a Cadillac Escalade, but you only got uh, Pinto money. That makes sense? You're not going to ask yeah. God for something that why would it be in his will when you can't even afford we don't have a metro here. You can't afford a Toyota to sell, but the Lord got me this Cadillac Escalade. It's $900 a month. Your rent's less than that. It, that $900 a month you're going to spend is how you used to live. Don't talk about the Lord bless me with it. No. You would not have did something done. Prayer says I'm going to know when the will of the Lord is because he's not going to allow me. He's going to say, make common sense. Don't get out there and buy something or try to get something and you can't even afford to feed yourself. we got to be smarter and understand prayer will help you see some things. So when it talks about fasting and prayer, all I'm going to let you know is this. It's not a law that you have to fast. But if you want to fast, that's fine. But if you're diabetic, you ain't got to be this fast. 
Let me say that again. Fasting means no eating of food. That's what it means. We done added water and soda and everything else in it. Fasting means don't eat any food. That's what it means. But if you're diabetic, you, honestly, you have no business to fast. Because all you need is your sugar to drop, or your sugar go up, and now you're in trouble. If you want to do it, you go right ahead, but you have to warn twice. Now, I know that didn't work, but it sounds good when I say it. It's take care of yourself. God wants you to know food, but take care of yourself. So as Luke wrote Acts 2nd chapter, verse 142, they continue steadfastly in the prayers. He was referring to the disciples and sinners of the Church of Christ to pray whenever and wherever the church meets together. Every time they met, he wanted to make understand that you should pray. Amen. When y'all come here on the weekends, when ladies came to this, pray. When y'all get together on the way to Florida in the van, pray. When y'all just come together to place raised, I'm praying, please let me be Lisa and Jeremy. Please, I don't want to lose it. They don't have to hear it for the next Fifth time. So, okay, y'all laughing, but I'm just saying, it's talking to God to <laughs> make sure. But it's like, when you come together, pray. That's all he wanted to understand. He said, you don't have to have set times. Just when you come together, when you're in the church house, when you're from house to house, you ought to have prayer. That's all. When you eat your food, you ought to pray. You have no idea what the person did with your food that you got from another place. Before we get that, if you know me, I don't go to eat any restaurant or any fast food place where I can't see them cook my food. It may take a while, so that's why I love Burger King. I can look right at them. Right, dead set. Hey, hey, that, uh, that bread, who, who they going to? Because uh, last night, that's where I went. I was so hungry, I didn't know. I said, they're the quickest, and I wanted a number four. And the guy, the way he was holding the bread, I said, hey, hey, can you give me some more bread, bro? He said, well, I said, like, you just wipe your forehead with your hand. He just looked at me like, please, can I have some more bread? And there's a lady that was sitting in the bathroom, you know, hey, like, hey, you know, can you give me some more bread? And get like this, and then he said, no. She said, I have to. I guess if you just don't want to say, I have to see. Now, he probably didn't mean no harm, but I just know he wiped his head. And, and he got, the, you know, he got sleep. He got it rolled all the way up, so now the underarms are showing. And he felt like, uh uh. So I still pray over that food because I'm thinking, I don't know what you did, but I have missed like man. But the point is, pray in every situation. You never know. When you get in your car, how do we know this is not our last time going to where you got to be? Lord, give me to my destination state. Don't just take God for granted and think God got you, which he know he does. But talk to him, Lord. I know I'm on my way because they travel. I thought I traveled. They travel everywhere. Going places in the woods, in the back woods, and only there's no cell service. But LaPons know every back row, every cook cranny, but you keep it for Please let him get out of the way. He's going to please let God don't kill him. Because he done said something to her, and then she's all like, hey, I asked him. I should say it. <laughs> don't make prayer something that you've got to do because that's what you're supposed to do on the acts of worship. That's not what prayer should be. Prayer should be so much in your heart, so much in your daily routine that you say prayer. You're praying? You pray? Yes. So when you examine yourself, See if you have been baptized for the rest of sin. You're glad to receive the word. You're actually studying, sharing, reading God's word, apostles, doctors, teachers. Your fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ as well as with God. You're in breaking the bread. So when we come together to have a meal, you're participating in the meal by bringing something to the meal. Fellowship means participating. That means doing something with it. Also participating in the Lord's Supper as well. And in prayers. When we come together, when someone's praying, you should be praying as well. Jesus, Jesus gave his example on how to pray. Therefore, if you want an example of the first church, if you're not filling these things, if you're only doing three out of five, you really ain't the church of Christ. But if you're doing four out of five, you really ain't the church of Christ. But if you ain't doing the first one, which is being glad to receive the word being baptized, you show sure enough ain't the church that Christ did. But if you're one of those people who have three out of five, four out of five, two out of five, you repent and get it right for God right now. That's too easy. Because you know all you got to do is you've heard and you have no excuses. But if you're here and you're not a Christian, then you can remedy your spiritually lost condition. Simply meaning, you have an opportunity to obey the gospel by hearing that Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was in the ball grave, the grave that didn't belong to him, but he knew we were going to be that long and being resurrected on the third day according to the scriptures. You understand 
that to be something true, but by receiving it means you have to believe it. So if you believe it, then that's the gospel of Jesus Christ, then what are you going to do about it? And that simply, to obey it simply means understanding that Jesus died for our sins, buried again on the third day, rose again to according to scriptures. You simply repent, which means change your mind about how you used to live. Be baptized for the removal of, the, the removal of your sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then try to continue to live righteously for Christ on a day-to-day -day basis. If you need to respond to the invitation of salvation through Christ, then you can come down now as we sing this song of encouragement. Have you been 